Hello and welcome to Dateline London. The International Monetary Fund and the Bank of England suggest Britain getting out of the European Union could be bad or very bad for the economy. So why are the opinion polls on Brexit more or less neck and neck? Plus, corruption, a big problem for Africa and developing countries, but also how big a problem for us? My guests today are John Fisher Burns of the New York Times, Mark Roche of Le Point and Le Soir, Janet Daly of the Sunday Telegraph and Vincent McGonvey, who's a writer and commentator on African affairs. Good to see you. The Governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, pointed out that the biggest political decision in the lives of most British people voting to leave the European Union could produce a technical recession. Christine Lagarde of the International Monetary Fund also suggested things could get rough. With so many heavyweights against Britain leaving the EU, why are the opinion polls so close? Well, we can get on to the polls in a minute, Janet, but, I mean, Mark Carney, first of all, I mean, here, here is a serious person in an important position making a serious point, and he has been yeah. ridiculed by some people for, yeah. for saying it. Uh, the, the operative word was could. Mm -hmm. Could produce a recession, a technical recession, whatever that is. Uh, and the IMS saying it could produce results that are very, very bad. It sounds like they're talking to six-year-olds. You know, I mean, this is precisely the point. The more big battalions are brought in, obviously, by the government to argue in apocalyptic terms about how terrible, terrible it would be, or could be, more to the point, um, the more people suspect that this is a stitch-up, that people are not believing. I mean, even if these arguments are perfectly credible, even if they're sound, there are very few empirical facts because you're prophesying about the future, which is always a dodgy thing to do, especially when you're an economist. And most <laughs> people... get it right so often. <laughs> yeah, so often, yes. So, uh, so people are thinking... Why are these people trying to bully me? Why are these people trying to frighten me? Why are these people trying to threaten me? And the British population, in my experience, is the most resilient population in the world when it comes to being bullied and threatened. They don't you, you, like it. You may it. be right about that. But, but look, Mark, Mark Carney, if he didn't say something which he believes in, uh, about this and it goes terribly wrong, it's very difficult to say that the biggest decision in our lifetime to get out of EU would l result in a sort of flat calm yeah, and everything would be hunky-dory. I mean, nobody say, knows exactly what will happen. But uh, I didn't say that you shouldn't have said it. Right. Your question was, why didn't it have any right. effect on mm -hmm. public opinion? So you think and he it, should have said it? But it I, it's all right for him to have said it. I mean, I, it, it's just a question of how you take it. Uh, th there are, very, you know, the, the uncertainty, the risk is what all of these big battalions who are coming into this fight are talking about. Well, there are uncertainties and risks on staying in. We have, you know, this is a, this is a train heading very fast in a direction that most people or many people in this country don't like. So the question is, how much risk is there in the other option in staying in? Mark, risk... There is risk, obviously, in either option, isn't there? Because nobody knows quite what would happen if we stay in the EU, because it's changing. Well, uh, look at the pounds, down. Look at foreign investment, stall. Look at the growth, stall. Why? Not because the British people um, doesn't believe or believe the economic argument, which is predominant that it will be uh, unknown quantities and the economy doesn't like unknown, and it's better to stay to um, continue with the economic situation we have. I think, basically, they have lost the economic, the economic argument, the Brexiters. The only argument they have, which is the strong one, and the whole campaign is around that, is immigration. Economy, it's quite clear, it'll be a mess, it'll be... Uh, renegotiation of lots of things, more the, at the basic of economic growth, there is um, the belief that uh, confidence, you know, trust. Confidence and trust. Confidence, yeah. and that is not there. But uh, the Prime Minister clearly is thinking along the same lines as Mark because he again has been talking this weekend about, you know, uh, there will be, it will be problems with our exports if we're to the European Union if we were to pull out. There'll be tariff barriers and so on. That's, that's the implication. He, of what he, he's he needs to learn a few lessons uh, about British <laughs> society. <laughs> I'm an outsider, but I think I, I have some friends who are British and I was discussing with them trying to find out where they should be. And somebody says, I really would like to stay in but this guy thinks he can bully us in a democracy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to vote the other side, you know, uh, Brexit. <laughs> so you agree so with I'm, the psychology uh, you know, so that Janet said? So many people are doing that. Mm -hmm. 
But right now, as we talk, what concerns me very much is trying to shut down this guy who is trying to say anything. You know, I, I'm such a fanatical believer in freedom of expression that I think the right thing is to allow anyone who is anyone. If the prime minister can say things, why not Bank of Governor, Governor Bank of England and so on? Let them say, because let them say exactly what they want to do uh, or what, what will happen and let people then, then judge. The only problem, I think, what is happening with, uh, with this whole debate uh, and why people may vote is really that so-called fear factor. You introduce fear, you know, people who are sensible, who know that you're just scaremongering, mm -hmm. will just vote the other but way. But there are those who think there's scaremongering on both sides. You know, if we stay oh, yeah, in the EU, so. it'll be a, it'll be a disaster. And, 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 I well, mean, those, uh, when we look at the Christine Lagarde's um, and the uh, Mark Carney's, and a whole battalion of people who have been warning about the disastrous consequences of Brexit. Uh, I'm reminded of the Mandy Rice Davis axiom, uh, for those who are old enough to remember, Mandy Rice Davis and um, Christine Keeler, Keeler the and so forth. There and um, they, would say, they would say that, wouldn't, wouldn't they? In other words, none of these people are saying anything but what you would expect they would say. Uh, it may be they believe it. It may be they don't believe it quite with the intensity with which they express it. Um, I thought one of the more revealing um, summaries of this was made by Nigel Lawson, the former Chancellor of the Exchequer, on the BBC's Question Time a couple of weeks ago, when he was talking about I, uh, something which I, seems to me a certain clarity has emerged from this. Um, it's not clear what the economic outcome, and he says this, he's a, he's a, he's a Brexit Brexiter, man, he but he said we have to concede that it's not clear what the economic impacts are going to be. There may be, at least in the short to medium term, adverse effects. But on the other side of the argument, he said the real issue here for Brexit is, is not economic, it's political. Do we want to be a self-governing country? Mm -hmm. so, and, so. and that's something which every time I've seen an uh, the arguments made in front of an audience draws the biggest yeah. cheer of course. and applause uh, that, that of any. That globalised world, what will be the role of Britain on its own? It'll be back of the queue oh. or the line yeah. at that, the end. Of course, an American yeah. president. Yeah. To, to uh, who what uses will it the word be to, uh, to uh, negotiate me, the uh, trading agreement? This, 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 yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is a terribly important point about they would say that, wouldn't they? Because it's a question of whether the, uh, the big everything, so the big bureaucrats, the big corporations, the big government fanatics, the big unionists, uh, and I mean by that European unionists, are in some kind of oligarchic relationship with ordinary people. What has happened to democratic accountability? The European Commission is effect I mean, the Euro European Union is effectively run by its commission, which, who are unelected officials. There is a sense that not only are you losing self-government, but you're losing democratic government and democratic accountability. And this is the real threat. That's the real the risk European of remaining. The Parliament is elected, the Commission... Oh the Parliament the, I'm doesn't sorry, create... the Parliament is elected and plays a big role. And it doesn't the commissioner, they are chosen by the government who are elected, yeah. so I don't yeah. know where they are. They are chosen problem. appointed officials, and the commission... By the government and, who are elected. And the commission creates legislation in the EU, unlike in a if, parliamentary if you, democracy. If you ask me sincerely what side would I, if I was, if I was uh, you know, born in England and I'm here and everything, I would have said perhaps, you know, I want to remain in. Um, this thing of Brexit scares me, I would say, right now, because as an immigrant in this country, and you've just said one of the biggest points for them is we want to get out so that we can control immigration and all these types of things. I mean, really? But Europe you know? has a huge problem with immigration, and it, it's yeah, but, reaching... Uh, so no, does no, the world. Sorry. So yes, does exactly. the whole world But outside. it's reaching terrifying proportions. The migration crisis, which should have been a temporary crisis, has become a permanent tragedy. But well, Britain is well, not suffering. Because the EU... Britain where, is, where is the biggest problem? problem. Out of shame. The, so the EU... You, you are, the EU <laughs> you are <laughs> pinpointing a problem that doesn't but exist in Britain. I'm not talking about Britain's problem with immigration. Yeah, but it's the Brexit we are discussing. Hang on, hang on. I'm talking talking about the incompetence of the European Union. If the European Union exists for anything, it is to solve or deal with problems like the migration crisis. But then is the United States incompetent? Because it's 
been oh, yes. fundamentally unable. Respect. Well, then it's got nothing uh, but, to do with the EU, then, has it? The United, the United yeah. States cannot deal the United with States, But you know, the United States is precisely the model that Europeans, he Europeans are heading for. They want this federalized union of nation states, a United States of Europe. No, and in, let, let, in, let no, me no, no, be no, frank no. with you. Yeah, you, you go, you, go you, ahead, Vincent. You're, you're be Europeans, frank. Europeans around here. Yes? yes? Do you think yes. you have a problem with migration? It's a lie. We have a very big problem with migration. In Uganda today, we have millions of, of, of refugees and so Kenya on. has a huge problem. That's one. But if I take you all to history, who has migrated where and settled where in South Africa, Kenya, and all these other places, you know, even Australia and all these countries? Europeans. So it was so good for you to, <laughs> to migrate, and it was so wonderful. We didn't even have laws. Very good and point. They, come back, they don't want us to come here. As oh, somebody no. who spent most of my 50, 45 years in journalism, traveling and living in the distant parts of the world, I reproach myself and, for that matter, most of my colleagues for not having realized that uh, this divide between the rich world and the, the poor world, between the haves and the have-nots, uh, between the north and the south, could not be sustained. That the millions of the have-nots in the world who now have satellite television or they have uh, mobile telephones, they know, now know how the rich live, and they are no longer willing to wait more no. generations. Yeah. Yeah, and we are going that, to whatever we do that's about the Europe. Whether we're in Iraq, yeah. do, yeah. do we all agree yeah. on that? Yeah. And they that's want to go to yes. Britain, but, but, and Britain but, doesn't let them in. But it's a question of it's whether. It's not the fault of the Europe. It's a question <laughs> of whether you have a polity, whether you have a political union that is capable of dealing humanely and justly with that kind of problem. And the thing that has been so scandalous about the European Union. Union's handling of the migration crisis is they've made such a total mess of it and they've created a prolonged tragedy, a global tragedy why out of Britain, something. Why well, hasn't Britain taken any sorry, of them? Sorry, that's so not Britain the point not I'm making. My, I'm talking about the effectiveness. Well, it's essential. Okay. I'm talking you know, about the effectiveness can, of the European Union can, can as a political I say union. About the, we speak about Brexit here and the immigration is at the center of the Brexiteer. And what they don't realize is Britain hasn't taken any immigrants. It's, it's all the Europeans can, who have can, taken can them, the a, last you, lot. You, you very accurately, I think everybody would agree, uh, put your finger on something about the psychology of the British people, which yeah. is that we don't like to be bullied and told what to do. We just don't like that, P particularly by people in authority. But can I ask something else about the, uh, the psychology of the British people? If they don't understand some of the facts, and I think all of us around the table don't quite know which facts are really facts in this, yeah and they look at who should I trust in leadership in this. They have got, on the one side, foreign leaders who have Britain's best interests at heart. You may disagree with them, but, <laughs> but uh, Barack Obama, Obama has been a good friend to Britain. On the other hand, on your side, there is you know, Vladimir Putin, Marine Le Pen, uh, oh, no, you're, no, no. You're, on, George Galloway, no, no, and no, no, some no. others. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Yeah, no, no, no. no. You, don't, you don't have to equate the Brexit camp with the most disreputable people who support... Well, who, 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 who are the good guys? Who are the good guys on your who side? Who are the Michael leaders. Gove, Nigel the foreign leaders. Lawson. The foreign oh, leaders. foreign leaders. No, 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 that's not fair. Foreign leaders shouldn't get a look-in in this. This is not a foreign question. This is a question for the British. That's and for their, their own question. No, no, no. It is a European question. Fear European. The reason that European leaders can't, European leaders specifically, can't be trusted on this is because the Europeans are terrified that if there is a Brexit, it will create a domino effect, and that other countries, which, as you know, Mark, have tremendously anti, have Eurosceptic movements, growing Eurosceptic movements, sometimes of the dangerous far right, that these will start, those movements will start to demand their own exit strategy. So that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a fair point, that's Mark. A very that's fair point. Fair. Yeah. Very fair Listen, point. But yeah. But that means that's so important that Britain stay in, that we oh, avoid, <laughs> that we avoid <laughs> no, we Europe haven't. becoming um, a part of this uh, no, extreme no, right you're wing. You're, not. To you're exacerbating. <laughs> you're exacerbating that kind of far right nationalism by enforcing no, the uniformity of right the European Union. The, 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 the Brexit. When you look at UKIP in this country, yes, okay. absolutely. They are Brexit. Not. Listening to the vehemence and intensity of this debate, it strikes me that maybe everybody's missing the point here. They talk about Europe, the Europe we will either remain part of or leave, as if it's static. It's not. It's highly dynamic. We know that there are forces at work in all of the major Western European 
countries which are heading for a kind of Brexit of their own. We don't know how strong those forces will be a couple of years from now, and it might be that the people who wish for a deeply reformed Europe will be pushing on an open door. And thus, if Brexit uh, is not, does not win, and I don't think it will, I think we're going to see a repeat of 19... 75, no, we when reform. they were close, the polls were <laughs> close, but 67% of those yeah. who voted, I voted the, for the staying last word in. This to Janet, but you she's somewhat outnumbered here. They Go didn't ahead. take the opportunity to reform when Cameron went to renegotiate. Cameron presented them with a, a very mild, lukewarm reform agenda, and they, they effectively sent him away with almost nothing. So the consequence is that you have to assume that the EU is unreformable in the ways that matter, that it will not back down on its ideological because commitments it to, el to oligarchy. <laughs> 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 and he got the good deal. Uh, I right. tried it. Well, okay. Anyway, I yes. tried with the last word. But okay. that. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm struck by William Golden, the famous Hollywood screenwriter, who said nobody knows anything, and perhaps yeah, we yes. should uh, admit, well, admit some of that. Let's move on. Afghanistan and Nigeria are two very corrupt countries. That's according to the British Prime Minister and just about any person who's had to deal with those nations, including Transparency International, which monitors corruption. This week, London hosted an anti-corruption conference. How much of a difference will it make? Can we, can we talk a bit about Africa first? Because uh, I was very struck by what the Nigerian president said, because it chimed with what I've heard at aid conferences, where people have said, yeah, aid, whatever. It's not the money going into Africa that we should worry about. It's the money that's coming out and coming to countries like Britain in various ways. Is, yeah. is that how you see the well, part I of the problem? It, uh, that's half of the story. Half mm -hmm. of the story is what he was saying in terms of what British responsibility is. You know, you are the guys who help bring some of these dictators to power in Uganda, where I come from. For Idi Amin to be the president, British intelligence, Israeli intelligence and so on, put him there. The current president who put him there, the West Americans, they've set up uh, special forces for him and so on. But how corrupt is that government, for example, that, that they have set up, they've helped to put in place? I, I give you an example in Uganda. The president, he's Mr. Museveni. His wife is one of the most powerful ministers in government. His son is the commander of special forces and commander of uh, what they call presidential guard brigade. His brother, a general, is corrupt to the rot. And then they use the same special forces to repress and kill our people right now, all the opposition leaders. It, like in the name of so. what, do you so, think? In the name so, of stability? or No, in the name of keeping the loot. <laughs> so that is why I said mm. it was half of the story. Right. He is right to ask Britain to show some responsibility. But what he hasn't told you, and he was a very humble man, is that he is the minister of oil. He's the minister of finance in Nigeria. He's the president. Why? Because when he came to power, he's doing great work trying to stop that corruption. He couldn't trust any single Nigerian <laughs> to take any of those ministries mm. because they are going to steal the money. You understand? So it shows how deeply entrenched corruption is in places like Nigeria, Africa, and so on. And I think that for me, as a Ugandan, what concerns me more is not those who are going to keep the money, but those who are stealing the money. If we and our governments, if Abacha stops the money, not Abacha, but sorry, uh, Buhari, Buhari, stops the, the money being too. looted yeah. by Nigerian people, there will be nothing for British to keep in the banks. That's a very, very interesting point. But I, I, of course, this is much wider than Africa. I mean, I talked to someone from Trans, uh, well, who monitors this situation very carefully and pointed out that quite developed countries, quite rich countries like Russia and China, have really, really serious problems with corruption. Well, if and you we want, tolerate it. If was, you was want what... to get rid of corruption, you have to get rid of tax havens because the conduit of all that money which is taken from Africa but also Russia, etc., is going through tax haven. And that ridiculous conference in London, knowing the role of the city in tax haven is taking all the money and then um, making fructified um, is, is, is hypocritical. And the Americans being there, they have two tax haven in Delaware and no in South Dakota. China has a tax haven in Hong Kong. India has a tax haven in um, Mauritius. And all the Europeans have tax haven which they protect. You want to get rid of corruption? You want to get rid hmm. of tax haven because they are parasites. Janet? I've got a bit of a problem with the, the uh, 
kind of surveillance that would be necessary to get rid of every conceivable money laundering and tax scheme. It means that you effectively you have a global police force which has access to all the financial information about every individual, because that's how it has to be. I think that the political answer is, rather than that technical financial pursuit and police state kind of pursuit, the political answer, we really know how to cure mass corruption, democratically accountable government, and free market economics. Well, and yeah, you've which got creates free, corruption. No, 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 no. I agree. It's I agree totalitarian. Democratically accountable government. Yes, but democratically accountable government. Totalitarian societies yeah. Yeah. with nationalized monopoly industries are the most. The old Soviet Union was the perfect model of systemic corruption, and that is what, if you get rid of those, and if you don't prop up governments of that kind with misguided aid pour money into corrupt government and maintain totalitarian corrupt governments, you're halfway there. John? Well, I thought one of the interesting aspects of the debate this week touched on aid with uh, Mr mm -hmm. Cameron saying, in effect, no, we cannot use aid as a lever in this. Um, the last time I looked, uh, the Western aid, foreign aid to Africa since decolonialization ran to the best part of a trillion dollars. And anybody who's traveled in Africa knows how little Africa has to show for that. So I would say that we should concentrate on doing what we can. And I think Janet's right. I think we're probably not prepared to take, use the sort of police state tactics that are going to be necessary to discover who the beneficial owners of all that property in Holland think, Park are. But we can do something about aid. We can tell go corrupt governments we're not going to continue to pour money into projects you should be funding yourself. But, but by telling them, you're leaving the problem there. The idea is really just right here, when you say democratically accountable governments, those are the governments, that should be the measure. The acceptance of those governments or not acceptance of governments that are totally corrupt. I mean, let me just give you an example. In this country, Britain here, there is a lot of corruption. I know people stealing money here and there in certain things, giving themselves contracts perhaps here and there. It might be there. But can you imagine Cameron going to the Minister of Health, broad daylight, he steals two million pounds, puts in his account. He would be inside prison. You understand? Mm -hmm. in, but Cameron, Bush, sorry, not Bush, but Barack Obama and all these leaders of Western countries know very well which governments in Africa. I, I give an example of Uganda itself. The money that came to, for AIDS, um, uh, malaria, well, he mentioned, and he, so on. He, David Cameron mentioned Afghanistan this, the and ministers, Nigeria. Ministers stole it. Mm. Well, there isn't a single project. Now you say, okay, China is coming, perhaps that's different. You tr they try to build a road, Katos Road or something like that. Ministers steal it. It becomes a scandal. But where and so, does this so, money go? This money goes well, in the no, city no, no. and but, this money but, goes but that's, that, that's in Wall right. Street. That's and right. so you need the Part police. of that money yes, comes here, but quite a lot of that money remains at home. So that's yes. what I'm saying. Even yes. if you cut off the tax havens, you stop yeah. them you, banking still, in they Switzerland, still yeah. Yeah. they would still steal the money. Mr. Levin steals the money and and the mainly money to keep there. himself in power. And at the cost of destroying the idea of personal privacy. I mean, that is a serious sacrifice. And I think the idea that every single person is guilty without due process, you know, there is no assumption of innocence, that the invasion of privacy, the invasion that of... Um, evaders should no, be no. pursued. Yes, but how do you, they should how be do you pursued. It's immoral. Yes, of course it is. But how do you distinguish the tax evaders without examining Don't everyone? Who have but, but, and there is a difference we already in do the it tax with, haven. We already do it, in a sense, with large deposits. If you turn up with more than £10,000 oh, yes. yeah. and put it in a bank, people ask questions, that's quite right. rightly, in the bank. So, that's right. You can do it in terms of scale. Yes, yeah, uh, there can. is a way of doing that, so which true. wouldn't affect everybody. But, but the, the only practical way for this to work would be if there was, how many countries are members of the United Nations? 200. If there was practically universal agreement on the measures that need to be taken in the recipient countries, the countries where these corrupt monies are deposited, and that's light yeah, years well, away. Well, actually, there, there, is, there, there is a CDE has yeah. done something. If this there, there, money was denied to the Chelsea Football Club or yeah. to, the, to, to, the, to the, the banks and the trading the traders in the city, where would it go? It would some, find, some pretty quickly, it would have, find have somewhere else to go. Here with, 
with money in boxes. In boxes. <laughs> in millions. Yeah. That is true. How but do you allow these guys to bring millions and hundreds of millions of pounds? Vincent, but, yes. Vincent, let me yes. just ask you to conclude this. Baroness Scotland, who effectively uh, runs the, administers the Commonwealth, said yeah. that the 53 countries of the Commonwealth could reach an agreement on this. It may not be the 200 countries of the world, yeah. and that would be a big start, but it, wouldn't but it? But you know why it can't? Because President Museveni, mm. uh, all these looters in Africa are not are part of the Commonwealth. They will not allow that mm. to take part. Just for example, it's just like the ICC yesterday, President Museveni, I don't call him president because they are now two presidents in our country. So on, the opposition has, is from <laughs> president, president, president. president. There's a big crisis there. But what I'm saying is he talked very badly and abused uh, ICC, which is now perhaps one of the international positions that can court. look into people, trying to kill people, steal money, do this and that. And the Americans, the Canadians, walked out of the ceremony to inaugurate him. Now, the problem is those leaders in Africa will not. So what you do is help us overthrow them, yes. help make sure that we have okay. democracy. We'll, leave, we'll have to leave it there. And Thank the you all. Well, is a useless organization. <laughs> <laughs> <anyway>. <laughs> he would say that, he wouldn't he? Would <laughs> That's it for Dayline London for this week. You can comment on the program on Twitter at Gavin Esther. We're back next week at the same time. Please make a date with Dateline. Goodbye.